Hello. Hello, Sam. Hello. <laughs> so I'm here to talk about my journey towards decolonial thinking, from sober raving to visiting indigenous tribes in Africa, to coming back and becoming an activist. My awakening to racial innocence began during the peak of my career. I threw an event called Africa, the Motherland, as part of Morning Gloryville, a sober dance movement that brought the notion of conscious clubbing to the world stage. Our event started at 6 until 10 on Wednesday mornings, and I started it to help me and my friends sober up from <laughs> drug and alcohol addiction. I was only 27 and couldn't afford therapy. AA was really boring. I actually invited people back home one night <laughs> and kept getting dismissed by the NHS service. It turned out as a young black woman without money, not an influencer and not seen as dangerous, I couldn't get help. So I had to save myself. Morning Gloryville started um, with only 26 people in a 700-person club. It then turned into a global movement with 700 people a month in London and in 23 cities around the world. Within 18 months, we'd gone from zero to 200,000 people in our global community, which was just insane. This edition of the Africa Motherland was the first disaster I had, and it was actually a massive turning point because before this point, I thought my job was only to put on parties. I thought my job wasn't to get involved in diversity and politics issues. And I used to say things like, I only see, I don't see color, we're all the same. But on this event, we got it really wrong. And it was very sad for me to swallow this pill. Whilst we'd thrown an event called Africa the Motherland, most of the people in this event were not Africans. So I woke up to thousands of angry emails from people calling us out for cultural appropriation. This had never happened in our four years. Please remember, these parties were on the news. We'd pioneered a massive industry and we're having massive DJs like Fatboy Slim, Carl Cox, and Roger Sanchez play for us. It was in this moment that I started to question, why has this happened? Why has this happened to me? Why am I sat in the middle of a lot of angry people of color and my community of mostly white middle-class people? I was born in Zimbabwe and brought up to be proud of my country. The thing with being brought up in Africa, in Southern Africa, is you're still brought up to adopt aspects of Western culture. Hollywood and post-colonialism echoes in your subconscious. I moved to England when I was 15, and five years later became stateless. But for eight years, um, I didn't belong to a country. I couldn't travel and had less work opportunities. What I realized in this time was my only salvation would be meditation and entrepreneurship, which is why I grew Morning Gloryville to 12 cities within three months. Unable to travel and stuck in the UK, but putting on parties in different countries felt like an act of rebellion. I think when we've all faced oppression, we've got different ways of, um, of overcoming it. For me, living a happy life, putting on parties that made the news, and seeing my friends raving at the top of venues like the Shard, Somerset House, just gave me the ultimate yes. But for every success, for every generous mentor, there were limitations and challenges. 
And I'm really sad to say they did have to do with my age, my blackness, and my unboxable personality, like pulling out my phone on a TED stage. I encountered glass ceilings um, from funding deals to industry awards to memberships, often wondering, would things have been different if I was male or white? Or would things have been different if I was a millionaire? Like any great party, it all came to an end and entered a period of recovering from burnout, mental exhaustion, and financial losses. But actually, I'm really grateful for that experience because it opened my eyes to structural racism and the fact that the legal system is not created to support people with less money. And finally... <laughs> and finally, how crippling, and how crippling it is that we're all born into a society, into a world where we're bound to laws and rules that we're not actually educated on from birth. Luckily, a community of creatives and my well-being friends stepped in to catch me. And it's been two years of overcoming PTSD and reclaiming my confidence back. I was totally, totally broken. Cancel your trip to Burning Man. Go to Africa. Go and find and meet indigenous communities you've never met before. Spend time with them. This was a message I heard during a meditation one morning, and I'm so glad I listened. People ask me how I go from sober raving to decolonization and sovereignty reclamation. And really, to be honest, it feels the same, it's just different words. After the Africa motherland disaster, a penny really dropped. In my move from Zimbabwe to England, I'd pushed away my indigeneity. So I took this trip around Namibia. And it wasn't about getting a yoga certificate. It wasn't about drinking ayahuasca. And it wasn't about exploring export um, options. It was about going to meet the gatekeepers of my original way, of our original way. The San and Himba tribes taught me about living a, a happy life. They taught me that it's possible to live with basics. And to this day, I really live by that value. The San of Babwata showed me that it is possible to live in a community and society without hierarchy. And the Himba men really impressed me because most of them have many wives and children living under one roof in harmony. Um, shout out to polyamorous people in the crowd. <laughs> we don't want your money. We don't want your money. You coming to visit us, you thinking of us, and you spending time here has given us hope and faith. This is what these tribes said to me before I left. In all the world-changing work that we do or think we do, I feel that I personally forgot some very basic steps. It's really powerful to turn up to someone in the middle of the Namib desert to say, hello, I'm here to see you, hear you without an agenda. That act alone felt like deep restoration work. Okay, so I'm just going to read that bit. We live in a world full of injustice, poverty, and discomfort. Fact. Aren't we tired about hearing words like decolonization, racism, and sexism, and feeling a dark cloud looming over us? Whoever you are, you will have at some point in your life committed, experienced, or supported systemic oppression. I have. 
It's time for all of us to look in the mirror and begin to own how we feed the colonial mindset in each moment. Are you ready to reclaim your sovereignty? Are you ready to reclaim your sovereignty? Are you ready to reclaim your sovereignty? Yes. Okay, that sounded more like a yes. I mean, this is big stuff, guys. What does decolonial thinking entail? My theory is that we actually need to adopt decolonial thinking as a way to become decolonizers. So the first step is asking questions. Whenever I'm given industry best practices or rules, I ask, whose rules are these? Who created them? What heritage was the person who created those rules? And what is the relevance of these rules in 2050? The second piece is a willingness to be stripped bare. If the process of colonization was about dividing, conquering, and dominating, then the process of decolonization is about dehumbling, de-armoring, de-humbling, de-armoring, <laughs> humbling ourselves and losing our sense of control and perceived power. The second, the third piece, <laughs> the third piece is humility. I ran a workshop in the summer that really touched me. A woman identifying as black broke down in tears. She was crying about the pain she'd received around racism and sla the impact of slavery on her family. She literally broke down to the floor and was just in a state. We asked her, what do you need? What do you need from us? And it was actually really simple. She said, I need some acknowledgement. I need some acknowledgement for this. The next moment after that was really surprising. I'm shaking just about to tell you. A young white man from Devon stepped up and he said something I've never heard anyone say. He said, I'm sorry for the pain that I may have caused you indirectly. He said, I'm sorry for what my ancestors have done to your family. He took responsibility for something he did not need to take responsibility for. And something shifted massively. The next day, this woman came up to me and she said, thank you, I feel whole. I feel like something's changed from that conversation. The next piece is generosity of spirit. I grew up in Zimbabwe, so it's really easy for me. Um, and I just encourage everyone, if you want to be a decolonizer, um, to adopt a generosity of spirit. Sharing food, sharing gifts, sharing loves, and really understanding that someone else's win is my win as well. I feel like I am now British as well, and I would love my British brothers and sisters to adopt this. <laughs> yeah, so, so that was um, the values and principles and ways to, towards decolonial thinking. But in order to do that, we have to, like to have a holistic approach. So what I suggest to people is really focus on having heart opening exercises um, as well. So you wanna be doing things like martial arts and yoga and opening your heart because having conversations is really good. And yes, it's a starting point, but you need to support your bodies in so many other ways. The next bit is conversation, which we've already discussed. And then there's body and movement. So I really suggest having fun in the process. Like, gone are the days of being an angry activist and just like,
plowing through everything. It's so important to enjoy yourselves, to make love, to play, to tickle yourselves in the process. And then the final piece is working with the ether. I feel like in this day and age, we don't call upon our ancestors enough and praying seems to have become uncool. But actually, these, um, this really helps because suddenly you're not carrying the weight of decolonization and sovereignty reclamation on your shoulders. You're being supported by something greater. So for restoration, these are the final points I leave with you. We need to educate ourselves because really that's what I've done. I haven't done a master's or a PhD on this. I've just learned along the way. So we really need to educate ourselves and then put those learnings into practice. We need to observe what is our privilege and we each have a privilege and then we need to actively start channeling that privilege. We need to listen to others and ditch elitism. And most importantly, whatever industry you're in, whatever job you're in, whatever you do, we need to decolonize every aspect of our working and living lives. End.